gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me uh, to announce Dr. Michael Adams today. Uh, Dr. Adams is um, a senior lecturer in the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. Um, the first time I have uh, met Dr. Adams was in 2013 at the YAL uh, Symposium that we held here in St. Augustine. And uh, Dr. Adams is um, the principal researcher of the YAL workflow management system and also the chief architect of this, of this system. Um, in 2015, we have started a research project um, uh, when I was in, uh, in Brisbane. And uh, now um, Dr. Adams has come all the way to uh, St. Augustine to continue working on that project. Uh, so that's a real pleasure for me. Um, although the talk today is not about that project, because it's not yet finished, and the talk is about flexibility in workflow management systems. Uh, before we start, um, let me announce something for the, uh, for the organization. There is a video capture here, and we plan to upload the video um, on the internet. So um, if you are on the video and you don't want to be recognized, please let us know that we can pixel you out of this, of this video. Okay, so thank you, and without further ado, Michael, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, you can call me Michael. Um, as on, as the, uh, Professor Hensa said, I'm from, Q, from QUT in sunny Australia, where it's currently in the mid-30 degrees. So it's a very different climate here. I hope you can all understand my version of English, my Australian accent. Uh, so we're going to talk about process flexibility today. Pretty much everything in life is a, is a process. Or at least when you've been thinking about processes for as long as I have, everything starts to look like a process. So when we, when we think about processes, uh, we think about it in a sequence of, of uh, actions, where we perhaps transform some uh, data or some service or some product and, and come out the other end uh, with some value added to that along the way. So given that we can describe everything in terms of a process, I've got a little exercise for you first up and that is that. How do you get an elephant in a shoebox in a process centric sort of way? Has anyone got any ideas? Any guesses? Three steps. I'll just drag this over so I can get on the uh, on the video. In, in, anybody? Okay. <laughs> Three steps. Step one: take the lid off the box. Step two. Push, the, push the, the elephant as hard as you can inside the box. Step three, put the lid back on the box. So three steps to any process. I mean, to this particular process. As I said, when we, when we think about processes, we're thinking about... Um, things in a sort of an assembly line. An assembly line is a natural way to think about how processes run. Uh, in fact, the Workflow Management um, Coalition in 2002, in the introduction of Workflow document, said much work, even office procedures, can be processed as an assembly line. So what is it about assembly lines that uh, are a good fit for processes. Um, you know, it's the idea that we can take some raw material or some basic service or some application for a loan or something like that and process it in some way so that at the end we have a finished value-added product or service, much like an assembly line. But an assembly line is not necessarily the best way to think about how work is done. When, when we try and capture something that happens in the real world and 
get it into a, com a computerised form in a, in, a, in a program perhaps or in a, in a workflow process, then we're losing some information from the, the real world. It, whatever modelling tool we use, whatever way we choose to describe a process in the real world, we lose some information because no, no modelling technique is perfect in capturing all necessary information. Indeed, the way that our programming is done follows the same sort of, mo same sort of model. You have inputs, you process those inputs and you have outputs. So technology doesn't occur in isolation. Our ideas from one area flow into the next. So the idea of an assembly line um, flowed into the idea or the way of thinking about computing. So Turing's um, universal machine, the von Neumann architecture of, com of computing, all sort of follow this assembly line uh, metaphor. So assembly lines are fantastic if you're building cars. Very efficient, uh, time saving, get the job done in the best possible way. And a lot of business processes too are, are, can follow the assembly line uh, metaphor because they run uh, very rigid sort of uh, processes that don't change much through each iter iteration of that process. But real world being what it is, there are a whole bunch of processes that don't fit well into that assembly line metaphor because there are, there are various ways in which people work to get the job done. And it's very hard to fit that sort of work in, a, in an, an assembly line format. So, as I just mentioned, processing, unless it's a very rigid process, we have problems representing real world activities. On the one hand, you try and make it understandable so that people can look at that model and understand the work that's occurring. But on the other hand, particularly if you want to execute it in some sort of uh, business processing system, uh, it needs to have all of the information that it needs uh, that it requires to be able to successfully run that uh, process. So the more, the more comprehensive a process model is, um, the harder it becomes to understand, particularly if it's a very big model. So for example, this is a very, a very simple model here, but you can see there are quite a number of different places where decisions are made. And so you, even in this small example, you start to lose the main flow of what the process is, is about while dealing with all of these choices. Work practices evolve, so they change over time, sometimes quite quickly. You know, organisations are always looking at their competition to see how they're doing things and, and um, maybe changing up the way they do things as well to match their competitors or they are seeking new efficiencies or they figure out a better way of doing something or a cheaper way of doing something. And so practices evolve. There's a lot of difficulty evolving processes to match the way that work practices evolve over time. Um, particularly when you start to think about, well, if I've got a version of a process running uh, and we need to change it in some way, so we've got a new version of the process now, what do we do with the cases that are running on the old process model? Do we migrate them to the new model? Do we wind them back? Do we start all over again? Do we let them run on the old, on the old uh, more in inefficient model? And so on. So all sorts of problems there. And also, um, there's difficulties in handling deviations from the central flow. So you can see here we've handled deviations from the central flow by uh, putting in some uh, splits and joins uh, where decisions might be made. But anything more complex than that, things start to get very difficult indeed, particularly in large models. Okay. So what's, it, what's an exception or a deviation? Uh, it's well known in the research, widely researched, the fact that any instance of any process, there will be some deviations during the running of that process. Deviations meaning um, ways in which the main flow is not, not, not followed. So in almost every, in almost every instance, there will be some, uh, something that happens, some event, 
some data inside the process, some external event outside of the process that changes the way that that process is handled or, or is executed. So there's two types at the control flow perspective. One is ex um, expected. Um, deviations are expected exceptions. They are things that you knew might happen, but you didn't want to clog up the process model with those things because they don't happen often enough to warrant their inclusion in the process model. Or they are, are unexpected exceptions, which simply means they're things you didn't think about that could possibly happen. An, an event or, or some data being outside of a range that you never, as a designer, you didn't think about happening at that time. And so that just points to, uh, well, traditionally it points to an inadequacy in the model. In other words, the model is less, less than perfect in some way. And so traditionally you would, you would update the, mod, the model to capture those things if they happen often enough. Otherwise you would just wear it, or you would just deal with an exception when it occurred. And the way they were dealt with is typically off the system. And when they're dealt, when they're dealt with off the system, uh, for one thing, it slows the whole process down. Things become manual, so you're losing the benefits of running a, a process in the first place. Uh, but also, the way in which it was resolved is lost to the organisation because it's done, man, done manually and not, um, you know, not, not, not recorded anywhere, not logged anywhere. So the next time the same thing happens again, uh, someone has to think up a way of handling that again because it's not recorded. So these are problems with exceptions or deviations in, in the traditional sense. Oh, by the way, unknown, sorry, unexpected exceptions sounds like unknown unknowns. They're things you don't know that you didn't know <laughs> until you find out about them, which sort of echoes what Donald Rumsfeld said. Okay. So, when we talk about flexibility, what are we talking about? Def here's a definition. The idea of process flexibility, or the term flexibility in business processes, is the degree to which a system is able to support or handle, or ha sorry, or handle expected or unexpected deviations. Okay, so it's the degree to which we can handle deviations or exceptions, whether they're expected or unexpected, um, without damaging the essence of the process and allowing the process to uh, potentially complete as expected. Okay, so when we talk about flexibility, we're talking about how to deal with these sorts of deviations. Okay. So there's four well, deviations or exceptions, sorry, sorry, flexibility can be categorised into four different categories. Uh, by design, we saw an example of that on an earlier slide where you just put a split in a process where you want a decision to be made. So that adds flex flexibility at that point because maybe it'll go this way, maybe it'll go that way, depending on the data and the condition on the split. So that's called by, by design. That's the easiest way to add flexibility to a process. And most, if not all, workflow systems support that type of flexibility. Um, then there's by deviation, which means you've got a process model, but at runtime, uh, users or administrators can choose to deviate the path, so miss, miss one or roll back and do one again. In other words, change the, con change the control flow. So systems like case handling systems uh, or declarative systems where the task is just there with no real control flow or maybe a, a guiding control flow and users and administrators can choose what order to do those particular activities in knowing that whatever order they do it in is moving the product towards the goal. So that's by deviation. The, 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 um, the important thing about deviation is the, the original model doesn't change. It never changes. Third category is under specification, and that means that um, the uh, process model at design time is, in, is left in, 
incomplete. So you'll have things like little placeholder tasks where at runtime you can plug in or, or add uh, certain tasks or activities there. Uh, two types, uh, late, mo late modelling, which means you allow the user to create a, a, a part of a process model at runtime to plug into that, that place. And the other one is late binding, where you have a set of possible um, additions at that point already made and you can bind that at runtime in the appropriate place. So that's under specification. Or um, the last one is by change. And there's a whole uh, side, um, a side project, if you like, or side projects of workflow that allow you or allow an administrator to change the actual process model while it's running. So you can take tasks out, you can put tasks in, you can uh, change the control flow and that becomes a changed process model the next time. Again, running in, the change in particular runs into all those problems of what do, what, do, what do we do with different versions, how are they logged, when do we swap in and out, uh, current instances and all that sort of thing. Okay, so they're the, they're the, four, they're the four, uh, category, they're four categories. YAWL um, supports flexibility out of the box by design, same as almost all, if not all, uh, workflow products. So it allows you to do branching, um, choice, iteration, splits, so XOR splits and OR splits are where choices are made. Uh, you can have deferred choices with conditions. Um, and even in parallel branches is a form of flexibility because you don't, uh, you're not controlling, uh, say you've got a, uh, an AND join, sorry, an AND split with task A and B, but you're not controlling which one ends first, which, 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 which one started first. All you're saying is you're not going to continue until both A and B are complete. So that's a form of uh, flexibility by design also. As well as, as, well as those basic uh, flexibility by design features, um, you also supports multiple instance tasks which allow flexibility by adding new instance instances of a task at runtime or having a, a range of, of uh, number of tasks that can be run at runtime. Run um, and also cancellation sets are a form of flexibility because they can, they can remove uh, tasks from the process for that particular instance only. So you all supports flexibility by design. And yeah, you all also can includes a custom service called the worklet service that supports flexibility by design, deviation, and un under specification. So in other words, every type except by change. Change being the most contentious one. So the aim was to overcome the assembly line restrictions um, so that it broadens out the benefits of uh, business process modelling and execution to those sorts of business processes and other processes that are more flexible. In other words, I'm not trying to force every process, every real world process, into uh, that assembly line metaphor. Now, you all is based on a way of thinking about work, uh, the way about people doing work called act activity theory. <coughs> now, act <coughs> excuse me. Activity... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, got a frog. So, in, in the... Um, in the years after the uh, Russian Revolution, the um, Russians were trying to come up with a new way of thinking about how people worked as a community to, co to correspond with their Marx Marxist views of how work is achieved. And so they came up with this idea, or came up with this theory called activity theory. It's not really a theory in terms of, well, um, 
make a proposition and see if it, see if it works. It's more of a way of describing how people work together. So based on observation, uh, it describes how, how people actually work. Without going into too much detail about that, uh, we derive some principles from activity theory that sort of, uh, that sort of, uh, re they, re they related to the way that a, a flexible workflow system should support work. So activity theory says activities are hierarchical, which means you have um, one activity with a number of actions. So in that, or in, pro in process modeling terms, one process with a number of tasks. Whether an activity is a task or an activity depends on the eye of the beholder. In, in other words, depends on how you're looking at it <coughs> and, and who's, who's looking at it. <coughs> <coughs> Activities are communal, which means they involve, typically or mostly, they involve more than one person. They involve people working to, to, together towards a common goal. Activities are contextual, which means they, um, they always operate within, the, um, with, well, within a context, but the people who, who, who work are aware of the context that they're working in. And people typically... Um, think about the context when they choose how to do a particular task. <clears throat> so, people being people, um, they, they, it's human nature to try and find the easiest way to do something or the most efficient way to do something. So, give, given a task, you might do it for a while and you'll think of an easier way to do it or a better way to do it or a more efficient way to do it. And so you change the way you do it to suit the context of the particular um, process instance you're working on. Activities are dynamic. We talked before about work practices or uh, e evolving over time. And they evolve asynchronously, which means sometimes they might not evolve much and then suddenly they'll change uh, in, in a rather large way. So when we're thinking about uh, the context of a particular process instance, uh, then the actions or the tasks, uh, the way we carry out that work, uh, is chosen with a, with, a, with a view to the context, as, as I just said. So any particular person may have a repertoire of actions or a, a box full of different ways of doing a task um, that they have in their toolbox, if you, if, if you like. So for, for any particular instance of an action or task, you will choose the most appropriate way of performing that, that, that task. Um, for example, I followed a process to get here to, today, and I'm, and I'm sure all of you also followed a particular process to get here, here, to, here today. Um, some of those processes will be similar to each other in some respects and different to each other in other respects. One way is the mode of transport that we got here in. Some people might have driven or caught a tram or a train or a bus, walked, and so on. Um, if you usually drive and you got up, went to the car, and the car wouldn't start, then you'll fall back to plan B, whatever plan B might be. And the way you decide on what plan B is is by considering the, the, the context of the situation. Okay? If you were coming in to do an exam, then you would do anything, or almost anything, to try and get in here. If you were just coming to a, bore, a boring class and it's, it's cold and wet outside, you might turn around and go, and go back to bed. It depends on the context. If, if you've got a bike and it's not too cold, then you might ride the bike. So you can see all of those decisions are sort of if, if statements, if the, if the context is right, then I'll take this, for, this course of action to be able to, uh, perf to perform that, that task. And that's typically how people work. Plans guide work, so rather than a process model being a prescription that must be, f be, f be, be followed in every instance, it's just a sort of a guide to get to a goal. You know you, know you, have, to, you have to get here, uh, get here, 
the car's broken down, then you'll think of some other way of, some other way of getting here. You don't have to really consider that until such time as you find the car is broken down. So a, a, a process description should merely be a guide to getting to the goal rather than a prescriptive a definition of exactly what you should do at every step along the way. And if we're following the assembly line metaphor, then um, you can see that um, a plan is very prescriptive in that, in, that, um, in that scenario. The last point I want to say about activity theory is exceptions have great value. Activity theory says whenever something happens you didn't expect, then that is a good thing because that leads to a, lear a learning experience. You'll learn something more about the process. If you find your car's broken down, then that, in, you know, when you think about it next, next week, was a good thing because it forced you to think of some other way of handling that, that, that situation. And the way you thought about how to handle that goes into the back of your mind and it's there next time so you don't have to expend so much effort next time that happens. You'll say, well, that worked last time. So it'll work again this, this, this time. So exceptions are, have great value because they are learning, uh, are a, a learning experience. Okay, so based on all of that, the worklet service in your all uh, tries to follow uh, those principles. So it sort of, it sort of uh, makes the assembly line format of a process model more, more flexible so that we can... Um, get to our goal, but choices will be made along the way that we don't really have to think about it at, at design time, that will get us to our goal based on the context. And it does that by providing a repertoire of available actions uh, to, for, a, for particular tasks that are at design time delegated to the, the worklet service. So you can have a number of different actions depending on the context of the instance the correct action will be chosen to handle that particular work at that particular time. And so those choices are made dy dynamically. So you don't have to have a user or an administrator watching over every single process. Um, it will use a set of rules to determine what the most appropriate um, action is. And you can dynamically extend the set of rules so that you can keep, add, keep adding new actions to the repertoire um, at, at, at any time, even, even while a process is, is uh, executing. Okay, so a worklet, we talk about a worklet. A worklet is an action in that repertoire of actions. So each action is called a worklet. And a worklet essentially is a your, your process. Typically a small your process, but doesn't have to be. It can be of any size and, com and complexity. It's self-contained process uh, and, and complete. So it's designed to handle one specific action at a particular time in the process based on the context of the case. Um, it's in the repertoire, as I said. It's chosen contextually at runtime by evaluating rules that are associated with that particular uh, task. Um, and so it, you can think about a worklet as a dynamically substituted sub-process for a placeholder in a process. A task being a, a, uh, the, the placeholder that calls the, your, the worklet service uh, for the correct uh, worklet to run in that situation. If the worklet service does not have a particular worklet that suits, uh, it will return the task back to the engine and then it can handle that task as it would, e would any other task. Um, so the idea is a particular task is associated with a worklet service and the, in this case there's five different worklets to choose from. And depending on the context of the case, uh, the correct or the most correct worklet will be chosen from that, uh, rep that, rep that repertoire of worklets. Okay. So how do you get a bear into a shoebox? Haven't covered all of that. Any, any ideas? No? Same as last time? 
not quite. Not quite. So yes, we're still going to take the lid off the box, but there's, a, there's an, an elephant inside the box, so we have to take that out first, because everybody knows you can't put an, an, an elephant and a bear in the box at the same time. So take the, the, the elephant out, then put the bear in, and then put the, put, put the lid back on. So you have, to, you have to consider the context or the state of the process when you, when, when you get, get, get to that point. So it's considering the state of the process or the data in the process, the context of that particular case that determines how to deal with uh, particular instances. So we're talking about context. How do we capture context in a computational form? There's two general ways to do it, which we won't go too into too much detail about, but one is divide and conquer, where you think about the entire universe of... Uh, of, uh, of data and context that uh, you will ever cover in a particular process. And then you try and break that down um, and describe everything there is to know about that particular co co context. Usually it's impossible to achieve because you can't think of everything, but also it's not really necessary because most of all, a lot of context isn't required. To make, make decisions, to make intelligent decisions. It also depends heavily on the ability of experts to be able to explain uh, what they do when they, when they do their work. And the, it's, it's been found that the more expert somebody is, the harder it is for them to explain how they, how they perform their work. So if you're a very highly skilled heart surgeon, for, for example, it's very hard to get that surgeon to be able to specify exactly what he, he does when, uh, you know, when, he's op when, he's op when he's operating on somebody. There's stories, stories about um, fire chiefs at fire sites who just get a feeling that something's going to happen, get everybody out of the fire before the roof falls in or something like that because he's got that much experience. He, he, he knows uh, that something feels wrong but he can't explain why something feels wrong. So it's very hard when you ask an expert, how do you do this, how do you do that, they find it very, very hard to explain. And that's one reason why a divide and conquer approach is difficult. A compose and conquer approach, on the other hand, is where you start off very simple, start off from the bottom, start local, and build your knowledge base up from very simple facts. Each time you uh, work with a fact that doesn't quite met, meet the current need or the current, uh, con current context, then you add a refinement of that fact. And in doing so, over, over time, you build up a, no a knowledge base from, vi from very simple facts to more refined facts. And in fact, that's the way the workbook service works, um, through the use of so-called ripple-down rules. Now, ripple down rules are a hierarchical set of rules in a tree structure. They're a, bi a, a sort of a, bi a, bi a binary tree and, uh, that's been modified slightly. Rip ripple down rules are used in all sorts of um, scenarios, including those there. I won't read them out, but at all different levels of, uh, of, co of, com of computing, different systems in different, organ uh, different ways, of, uh, sorry, different, con dif different contexts. They actually came from uh, medis uh, me medicine. So it was the medical uh, fraternity that uh, began the research into, into ripple down rules. Now, you don't need to understand fully how ripple down rules work to be able to use a workload service, but I'll just briefly work through them so you have some idea of the concept behind them. So a worklet selection is made through a ripple-down rule evaluation. So a ripple-down rule is a, is a collection of simple rules in a binary tree structure or a modified binary tree structure. So each, each node on the tree has a true branch and a false branch, like a binary tree. The true branch is called the exception branch. The false branch is called the or branch. 
there is a root node that just has a default uh, true as a condition. And so um, that branch is, so the true branch is always followed from there. If, so, so I'll go back one step. Each node in the tree has a condition uh, that, is a, that, is, that is evaluated and a conclusion. So if a node's condition evaluates the true, then the exception branch is taken. If it evaluates the false, then the or branch is, is taken. And, it, and you keep working down the tree until such time as you reach a leaf node at the bottom of the tree. Um, when you reach a leaf node, if the rule is satisfied, then its conclusion is returned. The conclusion in, in our case is a worklet. So it returns the worklet, uh, the worklet surface loads that worklet into the engine and then runs that as a separate case. If that rule is not satisfied, then the conclusion on the, on the, of the last node that was satisfied on that path um, is returned. So here's an example of um, the ripple down rules for a, the casualty treatment process, which is an example process in, in the worklet surface. You can see at the top, there's a, a node which has true as a condition, so that will always, of course, um, e evaluate the true, and a default condition which is never used. So we've, because it's true, we've, we follow the exception branch. If that node is true, then because there are no other paths to follow on the exception branch there, then that is returned. If that node, uh, node's condition evaluates the false, then it will move down the or branch to the next node. Now, importantly, um, this allows you to add, to add new rules because you might have a rule return, sorry, a, con a conclusion returned that meets the context of the case uh, based on previous runs of the case but is not exactly the best way of handling the current situation because of other contextual factors in the case. So in that, in that instance, we have to add a new rule. And the way a, a rule is, at, is added is if the terminal node that it reached through the path to the tree, if that rule was satisfied, then it is added as an exception branch to that tree. It's called an exception branch because it, it means this, this new rule is a refinement of the more general rule above it, the more general parent rule. Um, if the conclusion returned was not the leaf node, in other words, we went back up the tree because this one was not satisfied, then it gets added as an or, as an or node there. And that's the way the rules are added, um, which we can demonstrate using this example. So every, every um, RDR tree has a root node, as I said, that, with a true condition. So we'll always evaluate the true. So here we're starting off with a very general uh, rule base with one rule in it, basically. The condition is, if, if it's a bird, uh, and the conclusion is, it will fly. It's a very general rule. In most cases, if, it's a, you know, if we see a bird, we can assume that it can fly. So that, we're running our system for a while and everything's hunky-dory, everything's working well. And then we get a, a new case, which is uh, a penguin. Now, a penguin is a particular type of bird. Now, a penguin can't fly. So our, our rule base, we get, a, we get a case where we have peng penguins. Our rule base will say, well, yes, well, that's a bird. So it can fly and it will return, can fly. So an administrator or user will say, well, hang on a minute, penguins can't fly. So we have to add a new rule as an exception to the more general birds can fly. So that goes there as an exception because the terminal node was, success, was successfully evaluated. So now we've got another node in the tree. Birds can fly unless they're penguins, in which case they can't fly. And everything runs well until we get a new case of a cat. 
So uh, is it a bird? No. So this, so this tree is no longer followed because that it does not evaluate the true. Um, the default condition is returned from the root node, which means um, there's no suitable conclusion for the concept of the cat in our rule tree. So because of that, that cat is added as an or branch off, off the bird node. Is it a bird? No. Is it a cat? Yes. Cats can't fly. So you can see we have two nodes here with the, conclu with the same conclusion. So you can have, you can have two, two or more nodes with the same conclusion, but the conclusions are the same because of different, con different contexts. Nor's well again, do we get a plane? Is it a bird? No, so it follows the fourth branch. Is it a cat? No, it's a plane. So that gets added under the cat. And, and the conclusion again is it, it, it can fly. Then we get a baby bird. Is it a bird? Yes, so it will follow this path. Is it a penguin? No. So that goes under there. Baby birds can't fly. They are a bird, but they're not a, not a penguin. Finally, we get a, get a very strange case. If we have a penguin who can fly because he can get into a plane, then is it a bird? Yes. Is it, is it a penguin? Yes. But this particular penguin can fly. So he gets added there. So you can see every, every branch on, on this path is a more refined exception of its, its parent node. And over time, if you can think about a business process, over time you can get quite large uh, rule trees that make the selection, the correct selection, more precise. Okay. So where do we get our context from? Um, we can get it from the data of the, of the task, so the work item. We can get it from the case level data. We can get it from the process state. So what, which tasks are, are complete, which tasks are active, how long tasks have been running for, any, you know, anything you can get from process state can be used. External sources, uh, process logs, so previous runs of this instance, um, his, historical data, External databases, other services. For example, there's another service called the cost service, which calculates how much a particular instance is costing the, the organisation. You can use that data to, to choose the appropriate workload. Uh, and also any, uh, any user-defined functions and, uh, and values can also be used. So there's a wide variety of sources uh, of, of data that you can use to make those contextual de um, decisions via the RDR tree. So, how suitable is RDR for workloads? They, they're, very, they're very suitable because they allow that hierarchy of rules from more general to more specific. Um, they're local, they, they capture local data. You don't need a knowledge expert to create the rules. The rule creation doesn't happen until a worker, an end user, notices that the condition returned, sorry, the conclusion returned, doesn't match exactly the needs of the particular instance. So you don't have to have an expert sitting down saying this is a rule, this is a rule, this is a rule. Rules are only defined when the return conclusion aren't, aren't precise enough. Um, and the rule set can evolve over time and add more precise choices to the repertoire of worklets. Okay, so that's the worklet service. Now, thinking about the way that makes um, processes more flexible allows us to also think about how we can use that um, type of service to handle exceptions. So exceptions are a, particularly, a particular subset of the wider flexibility um, issue or problem. And so the worklet service idea of rip, ripple down rules and, and making appropriate selections based on context uh, can be extended to the handling of exceptions. 
exceptions, as I said, exceptions occur or deviations occur when the process model either accidentally or deliberately has some choice, choices left out of it. So the exception service is part of the workload service. Uses the same repertoire idea, the same ripple down rule technique, um, and it can handle both expected and unexpected exceptions at runtime while it's running, uh, hopefully with minimal input from administration. Um, so for a, for a particular specification, as well as having a, a set of selection rules for a task, as we've just seen, it can also have a different rule tree for each of up to 10 different exception types. And some of those exception types are at the work item or task level, so they, each task will have its own tree for a particular exception that will occur. We'll talk about what sort of exceptions could, can occur in a moment. Um, so at runtime, if an exception uh, occurs or if a trigger for a possible exception occurs and a specification has a rule defi def defined for that particular exception type, uh, then um, it will be tested and if, it's, if the rule is satisfied, then a particular exception handler is raised to deal with that particular exception. If there's no associated rules for that particular exception or if there are rules but the context of the, of the case means no rule is satisfied, then the exception is simply ignored. Okay. When an un, um, unanticipated or unexpected exception occurs, um, then we can add a new handler to the um, repertoire of exception handlers for that particular um, task or case uh, using the same techniques as we use to add a new rule to the selection uh, side of things. Okay, so if we look at the middle table first, um, these are the exceptional events that can occur during the life of a process that the exception service can handle. So the first four are, con uh, are constraint for, um, constraint tests. So constraints are tested when a case starts and when a case completes and also when a work item starts and a work item completes. What that means is the data in the case at start and end or the data in the work item when it starts and when it completes is sent to the exception service and that data is run against the rules uh, that are against those constraint uh, exception rule sets. If the, the values of the data in the task or, or case uh, um, are outside of a constraint, then a particular handler will be triggered there. A timeout can also occur if you have a timer on a task and it times out before the task completes, then the exception service will receive a timeout notification and it can handle that timeout. Case internal sorry, case external, item external means that a, something external to the process has happened that will affect the successful completion of the, of the uh, process. And so uh, you may want to have an exception handler to handle uh, that particular event that is triggered by uh, a user um, um, that raises that particular event as occurring, and then if there are rules for that, then that will be handled. A resource unavailable event occurs when the resource service tries to allocate a task to a particular resource, and that resource is unavailable for some reason. I'm not sure if you probably haven't covered resource unavailability yet in the resource service, but that's where the, the uh, calendar comes in uh, into play where a resource may be away or on holidays or whatever or a secondary resource is not, a, not available as well. Item abort means a particular service is, is, has been delegated a, a task and that service can't complete that task. And so that, they raise that type of exception. And a constraint violation is also raised by an external service when the data it receives or, or the data it changes while it's, while it's performing that task 
uh, violate some constraint. So all, they're the 10 different sorts of exception type. And then you have targets on the left, so you've got the work item or task level, case level, all cases of this particular specification in our version, uh, and ancestor cases, and I'll talk more about ancestor cases in just a moment. So any of those targets can take these actions or have these actions taken against them. You can, sus you can suspend a work item or case, for example. Continue means unsus unsuspend. You can restart a work item. You can complete a work item. You can fail a work item. Remove it. So the difference between complete, uh, complete means com it will complete norm normally with the data it has in it at the moment. A fail means it will be... Um, marked as a failed, com failed completion, but the process will still continue. A remove is like a cancellation. If you cancel a work item, then uh, any work on that particular path won't continue from that point. Or you can take the action to compensate. Now, a compensation handler is a worklet. Okay, so you can have a number of different worklets as compensation handlers. Um, and they will run depending on the context of the case through the rule set, same as, same as the other way. Okay. You can, defo you can, you can def define uh, so-called excellence, which are exception handling routines um, in, the, in the editor, in the plugin, in the, work in the worklet plugin. So easily do to be done gra graphically. So here we've got a, uh, a pre-constraint pre-case constraint violation, and what we want to do is um, suspend the case, run some, some compensation handler, and then continue the case from that point. So if we're starting a case with some data and the data isn't, isn't right, if it's outside the bounds of some constraints, then we can run some compensation handler to collect the correct data from the user or to, min to manipulate data in some way so that it is, that it is correct for the case. Um, the icons across the top are remove work item, remove case, remove all cases, um, suspend case, all cases, so, case, work item, case, all cases, um, continue case, work item, all cases, uh, restart, um, complete, and fail a work item, or a compensation down the bottom there. So as well as being able to do them graphically like that, draw them graphically, you can also add them to the table uh, in a tabular format in the, in the uh, plugin as well. You'll see that in a moment. So worklets can run in parallel with the parent. So in this case, we're choosing to suspend the case and then run at the compensation while the parent case is suspended because we want to gather some data that we need before the, case as a, uh, the parent case starts. But you can choose to run compensations without first suspending the, the uh, parent case as well. Okay. And when you run a worklet as an exception handler, then you may run other worklets from that worklet. So, sorry, a worklet as a compensation may have its own exception handlers, which in turn will run compensations, and those compensations may have exception handlers and so on. In this case, we have a parent process uh, with a task to do show task um, with a number of item pre-constraint events. There's a data in that do, do show event uh, fails constraints in some way, then depending on how it fails, we could run the appropriate excellent or exception handling routine. And that's the ripple down rule tree for the item pre-constraint excellent for that particular task. So depending on how many tickets are sold, you probably can't read that up there, but depending on how many tickets are sold, we can run a particular worklet to either book a smaller, ven smaller venue or cancel a show or take some other action. So in the compensation there, we run a worklet as, as a compensation handler inside the excellent. And because we can run worklets as, as compensation handlers and worklets can contain their own exception handlers, then you may have instances where you have a number of worklets running as a 
parent-child re uh, relation. In that case, if you choose to uh, suspend or cancel ancestor cases, it will suspend or cancel all of the worklets from the one you're actually suspending up to its parent, it, its eventual in, uh, top ancestor. So that's what ancestor cases means. Okay, so as I, as I uh, said a moment ago, the editor has a worklet plugin which allows you to um, specify uh, rules to create worklets and save worklets to, to uh, load worklets into the editor for e uh, creation and e editing, uh, to load rule sets from outside uh, in files. Uh, it, importantly, there's a, a way of rejecting and, re and replacing worklets. So this is the rule uh, substitution that I was talking about. If, if a worklet is returned that doesn't exactly match the context of the case, but it is the correct worklet based on the current rule tree, then we can add a, a new rule um, to a running case and it will then make the appropriate choice. Um, and this is what it looks like very quickly. So up the top there we can choose what particular rule type, whether it's an exception type or the selection handling type. We choose a task if it's a task level exception uh, and then we can uh, create a condition there. So this is, the, this is the condition we want to evaluate the true so that this um, excellent is run. Here you can see the excellent in tabular form, format. So the excellent in this case is we're suspending the case, then we're running the compensation handler called um, change to smaller venue, and then after that's finished running, we can then continue the case. Um, we can also describe that in the graphical e editor by clicking on the little uh, boxes button there. Uh, importantly, this is the cornerstone data, in other words, the data that was required or that was, uh, that was there when the um, rule was created. And importantly, this data uh, has to evaluate to true from that condition. In other words, uh, other way around, the condition must evaluate to true based on the data that's in, in this table. And that is because the service uses that data to find the rule that was returned that was not the most correct rule so that it knows where to plug this one into. So you don't have to think about where in the tree this rule goes. The system will work out where it goes based on the value in that data. So that's adding a new rule. Usually when you start a new rule set, as we saw in our example, we started with one rule and that is the ideal way to do it. Start with one rule and then gradually build up with experience over, uh, over time. But uh, in practical terms, you may have a, you know, a handful of rules that you add to, to begin with. This is browsing a rule set. This is, you can see in the, in the green box, it's the same as it was on the previous screen when we a added a rule. So you can see there um, the rule type, the task, the condition, its conclusion, in other words, it's excellent, and the data that was av available uh, for this rule to make that particular condition true. You can see on the left-hand side is a, a uh, diagram of the rule tree. And so you can choose rules there to, to see what is inside each rule node. And down the bottom here, it will show you the composite rule. So in other words, we, we, we're not... In our previous example, we weren't saying if it's a bird and not, and not, a, pe not a penguin, and a baby bird. We don't have to, we don't have to build those, um, uh, we don't have to join rules together because the rules are evaluated step stepwise as it goes down the tree. So this just builds uh, a, um, another way of thinking about that particular rule. So by working down the tree, we say if tickets sold at uh, a certain value, then run a particular, excellent. Except if, the tickets are less than, in other words, following the exception path, except if that the value is even less, then run some other uh, worklet as exception handler, or sorry, run on some other excellent, except if again, um, some other condition, then some other excellent. So this sort of just reads down the rule tree as to what is actually going to happen at runtime. 
So it's a good way of understanding how the, the tree ev um, evaluates. And this important, this is the important part. This is where you replace a currently running worklet with a new one. In, in, in so doing, you're building the rule tree and building the repertoire of worklets that are, are available. When you open up this di dialog, you'll see at the top all of the currently running worklets in the engine. And you can see which ones, what, or what rule they were started for, whether it's a selection or an exception. So you choose one, it will tell you the rule um, and the um, Ex the excellent that were chosen to run that worklet. So that was the most appropriate choice. Over here, we've got the um, cornerstone note rule, uh, the corner cornerstone data. In other words, the data content that was available when that rule was made compared to the data that is available in the currently running case. So by clicking on that, everything in blue are, val are values that are different values to the ones that occurred in, in the cornerstone case. So we can see here um, the, va the value for fracture is still the same, the weight's still the same, and the other things are still the same. But the name's different, um, the uh, blood pressure's different, the height's different, and so on. So obviously, one of those values in blue are the value that made the user think the um, choice that was made was, in, in, was incorrect for that particular data. For example, um, this particular patient presented with a rash, so the worklet that was returned was to treat the rash. But you can see here, uh, the, va the value for heart rate is, is, is really high. And so even though we need to treat the rash, and that's true, uh, maybe we need to think about getting, the, getting this heart rate under control first. So the heart rate is what causes us to need to create a new rule. Uh, the, and, the, and the rule will be, when we type it in there, heart rate greater than 150 or something like that. And a new worklet, say, tr to treat heart, treat heart rate. And, and then that will add the new rule to the rule set, add, add the worklet to the repertoire, and replace that worklet in the engine with the new worklet all on the fly. And, and importantly, that new rule will be there every time a similar case occurs in, in the future. So you won't have to do it every single time someone presents with a high heart rate. It's already there. Okay, well that, that, that was a very brief overview of the, uh, of the uh, worklet plug-in to the URL editor. So the key benefits of the worklet approach means you can describe the standard or, the, or this, this, the happy time, if you like, path through a process and any exception handlers and any selection plug-in worklets using the, exactly the same uh, modelling, tech, um, modelling methodology. So in other words, if you know how to create a, your process, you know how to create a worklet or a compensation handler as well. There's reuse involved, it's modular, so it makes it easier to, ver to verify because you're verifying smaller pieces of a larger process rather than the entire process as, as one verification. It allows for uh, ev evolution of processes because you don't have to change the parent process, you just need to add more worklets to the repertoire and that, inf that implicitly changes the parent process. If, it's, if you get an, un an unexpected event, then an administrator, as we just saw, can add a new rule and a new excellent or worklet based on that particular context of that case that caused the selection to be in incorrect in the first place. And all of those co uh, complexities as to downtime mi and migration and different versions and, re and restructuring models are avoided. Okay, and that's, uh, that's the end of the talk. Any, any questions?
Okay. Um, I would have a question. Okay. So, so um, yeah, looking at this example, <laughs> example work, so we have this this loop yes. track there. Um, is that um, is that something that you, I mean, you could also do that with a worklet instead of having an explicit. You can absolutely do that as a worklet. So, in very simple cases, you've got the choice between a control flow split and join, or you can replace that with a worklet if you like. Either way is uh, effectively the same, except that if you think of new ways of handling this loop, then you can let the worklet uh, repertoire grow over, over time. If you think of new ways of handling this loop via, via a split in the control flow, then you have to change the, change the, the, the entire process. So, so um, the advantage would be that the, the process looks nicer if I don't show the loop. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's right, and, and, and the ability to visualise what's going on behind, behind that worklet-enabled task is a problem for another project. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so um, would you advise um, starting um, with a very simple uh, uh, model and then let everything happen while the, 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 the workflow is running? It depends on what you're designing the process for. If it's for understandability, if, you de if you're designing a process that you want to show to people and say this is how the process works, then you don't really want to hide that much from you know, your, your, ma your managers and your business consultants and that sort of thing. But over time, if you want, to, if you want your process model to capture the essence of what it's supposed to do and use workers as a more exceptional behaviour, uh, then that would be the way to go with those. Yeah. Um, another question is the, the ripple down rules. Yeah. I remember that there was an explanation that every uh, condition is evaluated. And yes. So depending on the, on the value, it goes either left or right. Yes. Until you reach a leaf. Yes. And then um, the evaluation goes back until it meets the first node that is true. Yeah, well. Is that really the operation, the way it's done, or is it rather done in the, in the rules you have shown us? It's done the way that it's done the way that I showed you. Essentially, what happens is, uh, as it works its way through the tree, it returns the last node that was tested, yes. but also it keeps track of the last node that was satisfied. So it returns both nodes back. So it's not evaluated twice. No, it's not evaluated twice. It, it, it passes back two nodes and then they just they, they're compared. If they're the same node, then it was a leaf that was reached. If they're different nodes, then it was not. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions? Am I able to add some rules inside the tree in the higher level? Uh, no, because, no, because uh, as ripple down rules uh, work from the more general to the more explicit, um, to do that would be to destroy the, the, the integrity of the tree. But you can modify a tree by, by adding new leaves and it will work the same way. Yep. You, can delete, you can delete nodes from the tree because removing a node just moves, moves up one. Yeah. So that's a, that, you don't lose the, the integrity of the tree by doing that, but you would if you inserted a node somewhere else in the tree. Okay. Uh, if there are no other questions, uh, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, and we'll see next year. Uh, the exercise today is there, but I will not be there. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Okay.